number 25. And for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, um, if this is an item you want to com comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order of this item tonight, will we will we receive a presentation by staff and then following, uh, we will have questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. We have um, a lot of interest in this uh, agenda item tonight. Um, we've had hundreds of email communications on the item. Um, and I do want to allow the council to have um, time and uh, the energy, frankly, to make our way through a very complicated ordinance um, that is obviously of great interest to our community and is um, of great importance to get right is to the extent that we can. So um, I just wanna let everybody know there's gonna be a few things, a few changes. Um, I have received um, uh, requests from 12 individuals for extra time, I have granted those. Those folks are going to be going first and they will be getting three minutes. After that, um, this is when we open uh, public comment. After that, um, I will take public comment um, at one and a half minutes each until 9 p.m., at which time I will close public comment and to provide time for uh, council deliberation. Uh, this is an attempt so that um, we can deliberate and get through this tonight without working into the wee hours of the morning. So I appreciate, I'm seeing the numbers climb on the number of attendees here tonight. Um, it is not my intent to try to cut people short on communicating with us. We are still receiving emails. You can still communicate with us. We do all uh, see our emails live, but in the interest of trying to um, get through and deliberate on this. I am gonna um, restrict um, public comment after the extended time to a minute and a half, and I will be stopping public comment at 9 p.m. tonight. So uh, I will now turn it over to Lee Butler, the Director of Planning and Community Development to start the presentation tonight for City Council. Uh, and again, we will have questions from the council following the presentation, and then I would like to go to public comment after that. So thank you, Lee. Thank you, Mayor Myers and Vice Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development and the Homeless Response Director for the City. And I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, just confirming, um, are you seeing uh, the notes pages or the full screen? We see the, we see the full screen, thanks Lee. All right, thank you. All right, um, with me this evening and participating in the presentation will also be Tony Elliott, our Parks and Recreation Director, as well as Andy Mills, our Police Chief. And we also have Cassie Bronson and Tony Condotti from our City Attorney's Office who are also here to assist. All right, so I'm gonna go through a number of things here and um, just wanna let you know what we're gonna cover. I'm gonna start with some local statistics and Tony, and Tony Elliott and I will speak to recent issues that the city team and the community have had to address. Um, I'm gonna talk about how we got to the ordinance with community feedback through the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness, as well as um, council direction. And we'll also provide some background uh, related to the Martin versus Boise case. And then I'll go through the specifics of the ordinance um, with Chief Mills um, providing information on the enforcement. And I will also let you know that um, we've had hundreds of pages of comments, as Mayor Myers mentioned, and um, we have a number of potential changes that the council may wanna consider that um, have uh, resulted or are potential results of the um, community comments. So before jumping into the presentation, I'll just start by saying that we are not alone up and down the West Coast in particular, but across the nation, cities are struggling with how to help unhoused individuals. It's 
really the most challenging issue that many cities are facing, and it's a multifaceted problem with roots in economic factors, mental health issues, substance abuse and addiction, affordable housing, individuals' loss of connections with others, and inadequate federal and state resources, to name just a few. I want to acknowledge the complaints that we receive literally on a daily basis about quality of life impacts and environmental concerns related to our unhoused population. These are real and legitimate concerns and, and we hear those. I also want to acknowledge the voices calling for additional homeless support and resources. We have systemic funding and resource gaps at the federal, state, and local levels, and we're actively lobbying our state and federal representatives for additional financial assistance. The city is not going to solve this issue on its own, nor is it equipped to. Many of the factors are outside of the city's control and purview. I'll speak briefly to some of the distinctions between the city's and the county's role later. And I'll also talk about many of the things that we as a city are doing to support unhoused individuals in our community. To really address the problem, systemic changes are needed in the way we as a nation and as a state view and treat the unhoused. And I'll note here that Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County is taking significant steps in setting goals in its six month and three year strategic plan for addressing homelessness and that'll be going to the Board of Supervisors early next month. So I encourage you to review those materials. While we are working closely with the county on many issues related to helping the unhoused population, our community experiences impact from the impacts from the unhoused on a daily basis. And in response to that, the council has directed staff to update the, counseling, the, the camping ordinance. And so um, I'll jump into the rest of the presentation here. Based on the 2019 point in time count, we had about 1,200 homeless individuals in the city of Santa Cruz, with about 865 of those being unsheltered. That uh, we as a city represent about 24% of the county's population, but we have about 55% of the county's homeless population. And so many ask, why is there a concentration here? And there are really many factors that uh, contribute to this. As the county seat, we have the county's jails, we have the county's courts, and many of the county's services, like their health services, within the city's limits. And we're relatively compact. So if you don't have a vehicle, it is easier to get to goods and services in the city as compared to areas of the county where goods and services are more spread out. Given this challenge that everyone's aware of, what are we doing? Well, we're doing quite a bit as a city to help the homeless individuals here. This year, we'll be spending about $4 million for services, homeless prevention, and cleanup, not to mention a substantial percentage of police and fire calls that address the issue of homelessness. And that's in a year when we have slashed budgets and mandatory furloughs. So a few of those things that uh, the $4 million goes to. Um, two mental health liaisons from the County Behavioral Health Services team are out in the field with our city police officers. We contribute to the county's HOPES program, the downtown outreach worker program, and to county sheltering programs. We support mobile showers and fund a variety of nonprofits providing services for people experiencing homelessness, such as downtown streets, housing matters, Encompass Community Services, and the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County, among others. We dedicate a significant percentage of our community development block grants, our CDBG funding, towards addressing homelessness. Approximately $1.2 million in 2021, and typically hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. We got additional funding this year due to COVID. Um, the funds, uh, the CDBG funds go to homeless prevention activities like security deposit assistance and rental payments. They also go to infrastructure investments like nearly $500,000 that we're spending to support a new hygiene bay 
at Housing Matters so that unsheltered individuals have a place where they can shower and use the restroom. We also have significant costs related to cleanup efforts. Before the most recent storms in late January, our teams walked through flood-prone areas along the San Lorenzo River. They asked campers to move to higher ground. And they, after those individuals moved, they removed four and a half tons of trash and debris from the area, preventing it from washing into the Monterey Bay. We had another cleanup and restoration effort earlier last year that had a $200,000 price tag just on its own. And I'll share some photos that depict some of those cleanups in just a bit. In addition to the $4 million, the city offers rents at well below market rate to Housing Matters to Encompass and to the Homeless Garden Project as a means to support the great work that these service providers do each and every day. And of course, to address homelessness, we need housing. So just since November of last year, the city has approved or authorized construction of up to 425 affordable units. And 184 of those are expected to be supportive housing units that um, homeless individuals would qualify for. So that's five separate projects that the city has approved. So we really are trying to step up and do our part. Um, there are affordable housing projects that have recently been completed and others that are recently, that are under construction right now. And we're looking forward, very much looking forward to getting these additional units online as well. We've also increased the number of beds that we have for the homeless. And we work closely with the county on this. And these are estimations, but we had approximately 155 beds pre-COVID between the Pauley Loft, the Armory, and the Laurel Street shelters. And we now have a little over 400 beds. And um, that includes the Vets Hall, the Armory, Paul Lee Loft, and 144 rooms and four motels across the city. And the city, excuse me, the county has worked to expand shelter facilities in other parts of the county as well. And we have more beds now, both in the city and within the county than ever before. But of course, we still have a great need. While I'm mentioning the county, I wanna remind the viewers here of some of the varying roles between the city and the county. One of the things we regularly hear as the city is that we need to provide mental and physical health services as well as addiction and substance abuse treatment. And those are absolutely needed. And the county is the one that provides those services. The city does not have a public health department. Those services are provided by the county. And I'll note here that the city and county are working collaboratively on a wide range of issues, such as temporary shelter, long-term supportive housing options, outreach to people on the streets, and hygiene services for those individuals. And the city and county are actively lobbying state and federal officials for additional resources. And despite all of these efforts, and despite the highest number of beds we've ever had in the county, the situation remains increasingly challenging. I'm gonna share with you some slides of recent situations that our teams here in the city and thus our community have been dealing with. You can see here um, some of the, the grading that's occurred and um, some of the issues associated with um, restrooms that um, occur in our open spaces and um, you can see in these photos, some of the trash accumulation that occurs that our teams need to come in and pick up. <clears throat> Here's some more photos of that. You know, really significant costs that we bear to haul all of these things out. Um, oftentimes in areas where um, it's really challenging to get mechanical equipment. And um, in the midst of this, of course, you know, we hear often from the community, not only about the, the trash and debris, but also um, very real and very significant concerns about needles. Um, you can see here some of the um, uh, effects, uh, after effects uh, or the outcomes after 
Um, some of the cleanups have occurred um, where people have uh, either city and, uh, employees or um, volunteers have collected needles, and we appreciate the work of people who are out there and um, helping with all the cleanup efforts that we have. And then, you know, there are quality of life issues associated as well. Um, there are um, instances of uh, bicycle thefts where um, individuals um, you know, are um, collecting bicycles and it's, it's something that um, affects the quality of life. It affects people's ability to have you know, a kid ride their bike over to someone's house and leave the bike in the front yard. Um, I don't think um, many people would advise of that here because you know, we do have challenging situations related to um, uh, bike chop shops. And, and this um, isn't a, a, uh, a stale issue. Um, just this past weekend, you can see um, that some volunteers collected a large number of bicycles and, and also um, trash that our uh, teams went out and helped clean up. And then um, and we also hear from people about an, an inability to use um, some of the public parks and um, concerns surrounding that. We, hear, we also hear that, that people can still occupy parks and that people can still go to parks and um, there um, certainly is that ability. There are also challenges though, depending on the users. You know, if, if someone is planning to, to throw a Frisbee or kick a soccer ball, um, you know, the presence of a large number of tents um, does impact people's abilities uh, to use our parks um, in um, all the ways that they, they could potentially be used. And so um, we, we do hear those complaints on a regular basis. Um, with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to our parks director, Tony Elliott, to speak a little bit more about um, the parks system. All right, thank you, Lee, and uh, thank you, Mayor and City Council. Uh, for the chance to share some perspective uh, from the Parks and Rec uh, Department. So uh, I just wanna briefly share with the council uh, the context uh, to which this ordinance, outdoor living ordinance applies uh, to the parks master plan uh, and also some recent work done by the city's Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, so to start and just to be really clear, parks are, are just not good places for people to live. Uh, they prevent, uh, present harsh environmental conditions for individuals experiencing homelessness, and ultimately the effects of people living in parks has negative consequences on our habitat, protected species, public safety, uh, and it creates increased risks for wildfire and contamination to our drinking water. And as you can see from the photographs that Lee shared, uh, and as many have experienced uh, firsthand across the park system, unregulated camping in our city parks and open spaces uh, poses significant impacts and threats to our natural environment and to our community's ability to safely access and enjoy public spaces. The Parks and Recreation Department hears concerns uh, similar to what Lee was alluding to. Uh, we hear concerns on a near daily basis from park users about safety, cleanliness, and accessibility of parks as a result of widespread camping. And I won't go into great detail, uh, just in the spirit of, of time here, but I wanted to share an example, a recent example from uh, mountain bikers of Santa Cruz County uh, that recently conducted a survey to gain feedback on whether or not um, homelessness has affected trail riding in Santa Cruz. Uh, and based on this survey, 52% um, of respondents said it has affected how they use the parks. Yeah, thanks Lee on the, on the graph there. Um, so 52% said it affects how they use the parks. 15% of all of the respondents to the survey specifically called out the Emma McCrary Trail in Poganip as one they simply won't use. Uh, and female riders in particular expressed significant concerns about being fearful, not being able to ride alone, and not willing to take their young families to certain trails. And I want to acknowledge that 15%, while that seems like a small number to, to many, to me, that's alarming. If 1% if, uh, if of our community says that they're not willing to go to a city park or a trail because of fear, 
that that's alarming to me. So that 15 percent to me uh, uh, feels like a, a big a, a big number and a significant issue. Talking about the uh, Parks Master Plan here a little bit, the 2030 Parks Master Plan states the heritage of the park system reflects a community that deeply cares about providing and preserving the quality and diversity of the recreational, natural, and urban environments. And among the master plan's four overarching goals, two that are especially relevant um, as it relates to the outdoor living ordinance are, uh, one, to provide ample, accessible, safe, and well-maintained parks, open space, and active recreation facilities. And the second is to provide well-managed, clean, and convenient public access to open space lands and coastline. The current conditions, as you saw from some of the photographs uh, across many of our parks and open spaces, uh, in our city park system are in conflict with these goals uh, set by the parks master plan. So I want to shift gears uh, and talk about a, sort of an operational viewpoint. And so what I'd say is that city departments, including parks and recreation, are subject to wide ranging regulatory mandates. Uh, CEQA, we had to go through a long CEQA process with our parks and rec master plan. The city parks and rec department in particular, as a uh, regulatory body to some degree requires a variety of permits, <clears throat> excuse me, and agreements uh, for things like special events, use agreements, and leases. And from my perspective, the outdoor living ordinance will provide clarity on the city's rules and the city's conditions under which camping may occur. And ideally, it will help us to avoid costly remediation of large camps in the future. As Lee mentioned a little bit ago, cleanup. Um, in Poganip last year cost the city around $200,000 uh, to clean up. And the eventual cleanup of San Lorenzo Park will also be uh, very expensive. Uh, so this proposed ordinance is before the council today is in my opinion, an important step to clarify the rules and use conditions across the park system and ultimately help preserve our natural environment. Um, and finally, I just would like to briefly summarize uh, an important body of work that the City Parks and Recreation Commission completed in 2020 related to parks and staff safety. Uh, in January 2020, the Parks and Rec Commission initiated an ad hoc subcommittee to address concerns about the health and safety of parks and recreation staff and park users. Uh, over the course of six meetings stretching from February to September of 2020, a commission subcommittee met with employees, the police department, uh, and other staff to hear about challenges as well as methods involved in addressing negative, negative experiences of staff and parks users. Parks and Rec staff have experienced cases of assault, vandalism to vehicles, theft of supplies, break-ins, destruction of park grounds and facilities, and frequent aggressive behavior from individuals living in the park system. The Parks and Recreation Commission voted unanimously to provide a four-pronged recommendation to the City Council. Uh, and what is most re re excuse me, relevant as it relates to the outdoor living ordinance is recommendation number two that came from the Parks and Rec Commission. And that is that the city needs to address regulatory and operational uncertainty regarding its camping ordinances and interpretation of court decisions related to encampments. These inconsistencies are driving the lack of enforcement against behaviors that threaten uh, staff and system users, as well as leading to facility damage and environmental degradation in open spaces and natural habitat areas. And so from my perspective, the proposed outdoor living ordinance tonight is an effective mechanism in response to the work and recommendations put forth by the city's Parks and Recreation Commission. And the last thing I'll say here is just from the Parks and Recreation Department uh, viewpoint, we understand that this proposed ordinance won't solve homelessness. Um, however, what it does is establish clarity for the community and for park users and for individuals residing throughout the park system. It gives us an opportunity to match our operations with the goals set forth by our master plan and the Parks and Recreation Commission's recommendations. Uh, so I really appreciate the opportunity here to share a bit of perspective from Parks and Rec, and with that, I'll send it back over to Lee. Thanks, Tony. Um, <clears throat> there are individuals who are 
are unhoused who are camping in our community that um, are doing so in a manner that um, are not creating um, many of those challenges that we saw in those photos. There are individuals in our community that are um, uh, you know, cleaning up after themselves that are, that are employed, that are um, productive members of our, um, of our society. And there are also individuals that um, have, um, uh, that can create some of these challenges in the photos that we saw. Um, and that can particularly become exacerbated when there are large groups, when there are large encampments, um, and when those become entrenched. When you start to see the environmental degradation um, and you see the um, large amounts of uh, debris and trash, um, that is typically, not always, but it's typically associated with larger encampments. And so um, that was part of the focus of um, the work that was done. And um, <clears throat> that's a, a little bit of background and a little bit of the situation that our teams have experienced. And I'm gonna jump back uh, a couple of years, going from recent to a couple of years ago when um, the camping ordinance that we have on our books right now was suspended. And so um, we do, right now we have a, a ban, a camping ban, um, and um, that camping ban on our books, we have direction from the council to not um, implement that. And that is because it is inconsistent with the Martin B. Boise case. And what the Martin B. Boise case says is that if there, essentially, you cannot criminalize the act of sleeping if there aren't adequate shelter beds available for the unhoused individuals in the community. So sleeping in and of itself cannot be criminalized. Now, cities can regulate the time, place, and manner of um, where sleeping can be allowed, um, but it cannot be banned outright as is the case with our, our current ordinance. And I'll just say, you know, the current ordinance um, on the books also, um, you know, has been on the books for quite some time. And, you know, there were unhoused individuals in our community that were camping before that. And so, um, as Tony mentioned, you know, an ordinance in and of itself is not going to solve homelessness. Um, that is a much bigger issue, and it involves many of the, the social supports that um, I talked about earlier. Um, so following the Martin B. Boise case and the camping ordinance suspension, the council um, put together a, a committee, a community advisory committee on homelessness, the CASH. And the CASH met 16 times between 2019 and 2020. It came up with a whole series of recommendations. And those recommendations, many of them were presented to the city council back in February of 2020. And those became the basis for, that, that was, became the foundation of the ordinance um, that um, is before you this evening. And, the agenda report, you can take a look, it, it evaluates each of the um, recommendations and says um, you know, why things were included or if they weren't included, why they weren't, and, and if other things were, why that was the case. And so, um, again, a lot of that focused on these large encampments and how to address the large encampments and entrenchment. Um, we also have uh, policies related to um, equity, public health, and sustainability as the pillars of our health and all policies consideration. And that's another lens that we use in considering policy. Um, the ordinance that is under consideration uh, by the council this evening includes a number of things that address the health and all policies pillars. 
includes things like a daytime storage program for the unhoused so that they can safely store their belongings while going to jobs or medical appointments. So it contains behavioral expectations and locational criteria that protect the environment, thereby contributing to sustainability. It has provisions that, that preclude enforcement until COVID vaccines are available to the unhoused and on an ongoing basis includes provisions that uh, preclude enforcement during inclement weather. And it provides additional allowances for disabled individuals. And as you'll hear in just a little bit, um, we're also recommending um, some changes for um, uh, families and also uh, disabled individuals caretakers um, that came about as a result of some of the public comments that we received. And it has provisions that help ensure that all Santa Cruzans will have access to park resources that contribute to their health and well-being. So with all that um, background, um, I'm gonna jump into the ordinance here. So I'm gonna um, uh, talk to you about um, private property, prohibited areas, acceptable areas, behavioral requirements, and then I'll invite Chief Mills up to talk about the enforcement. Um, so starting off on the private property, um, right now um, there are um, opportunities for religious institutions to host uh, recreational vehicles, up to three recreational vehicles. And we're proposing that this um, uh, goes to uh, six, from three to six. And for businesses, um, that is proposed to go from um, from two to three, sorry, I didn't fill in that number there, but from two are currently allowed in businesses up to three. Um, that's, that's what the proposed ordinance is in front of you uh, this evening. There are also, uh, there's a minor change that came in as a result of public comment, and I'll get to that um, in, in just a little bit. When we get to the um, prohibited areas, um, I'll highlight some of the, the key things. So. Uh, the tents and encampments would not be able to block first responders or access to city equipment. They also um, would be prohibited from um, areas that are dangerous to occupants or first responders or to special status species. So uh, first responders, that includes um, fire or flood prone areas during uh, seasons when those issues um, could create hazards. And then uh, special status species, we've depicted those um, as um, our mapped sensitive habitat areas. However, um, not all of those areas may be off limits at all times. Um, so um, we would, uh, if the council chooses to um, support this provision of the ordinance, then staff would come back and identify here are the areas of the sensitive habitat where camping is off limits and here's where they could still occur. Continuing with prohibited areas, um, inside the San Lorenzo River bike ped path between either side of the uh, river there, um, in the water department director's source water protection zone, we do get a lot of our drinking water from San Lorenzo River. And there's a map that identifies areas that, um, where, where camping would be prohibited. And enclosed areas, and there are um, a number of areas that the uh, city could, or a number of reasons why the city could deem an area closed, such as um, repetitive cleanups being necessary or um, uh, significant issues with the police as it relates to um, uh, uh, illicit drugs. Um, and then um, one change here, we, we cited the um, neighborhood and community parks as a prohibited area. And um, for clarification, um, we wanted to make sure that we were also including um, the um, regional parks and the single amenity parks as part of that. And so um, those are considered as, as parks, but uh, we're, we're just making a language clarification so that um, all of the parks are included. That does not include the open spaces. We'll get to that when we're talking about areas where camping could be allowed. Um, and <clears throat> we'll show you the text of, 
of those changes uh, in just a little bit here as well. Um, and then city-owned beaches and uh, identified oceanfront areas are also um, cited as prohibited. Okay. Um, we talked about the, uh, the various um, parks here, and then um, continuing with the prohibit prohibited areas, um, downtown, there um, would be a prohibition in downtown. Um, there would also be a prohibition on city-owned parking lots and specified open spaces. So Neary Lagoon, Jesse Street Marsh, and Arroyo Seco Canyon would be prohibited. And then within 75 feet of trails in other open spaces. And so um, any areas um, that are outside of the 75 feet of trails and open spaces and that are not in the three identified um, open spaces where camping would be prohibited, those would be areas that, that could, uh, where camping could occur. So what areas are those? You can see here, um, Moore Creek could potentially um, have individuals in Poganip, um, De La Viega Wilderness Area, and Arana Gulch. So, um, we talked about the prohibited areas. So the potential encampment areas um, include um, the open spaces outside, greater than 75 feet from the trails, um, the um, sidewalks outside of the prohibited areas, and then specifically designated areas, areas that either the council, the city manager, or the parks director um, identifies. And um, we've heard a lot about the sidewalks, um, and we've heard concerns about sidewalks um, uh, in residential areas in particular. And a, a key issue here is that we are, that we need to make sure that we do have an adequate amount of space where unhoused individuals can sleep. Um, and so, um, that was one of the key considerations in um, including sidewalks throughout the city as areas. Um, and um, we'll talk about the options related to that in, in just a little bit. Um, I wanna go back to the specifically designated areas and um, clarify, and we have some uh, additional text that would clarify that um, these additional areas may be authorized on public or private properties in any zoning district and in areas that would otherwise prohibit such uses. So a downtown parking lot, for example, downtown has a prohibition and parking lots have a prohibition. However, specifically identified areas can still accommodate safe sleeping or outdoor living encampments um, if they are designated as such and only in a manner that is authorized. So um, showing the maps of what those uh, areas look like, you can see here is a map of the prohibited areas. So you can see the 75 feet of, e of either side of trails is shown in these sort of linear uh, paths that go through our open spaces. Um, and then downtown, some of the uh, identified prohibited um, open spaces and um, than some of the other prohibited areas like the wharf and the beach areas and so forth. Um, we also have a map of potentially prohibited areas. And yes, this looks like a, a large portion of the city and it is a large portion of the city. Um, what this includes is um, the wildland urban interface in the yellow hatch. Um, and that area would not be closed. It's not anticipated that that would be closed year round, um, only during um, fire hazards, and um, that would be up to the discretion of the, um, the fire chief. And then also there are um, areas where flooding could occur, and those areas could be closed um, in, uh, on a seasonal basis or in advance of storms, subject to the public works director's discretion. And then, of course, the, the sensitive species areas that we talked about. Again, um, we would be doing an evaluation of those areas and uh, determining 
whether or not um, camping in the manner authorized by the ordinance could be done um, in, uh, in a way that would not harm sensitive species. And then here are those two maps overlaid and you can see that there is um, you know, quite a bit of overlap between the prohibited areas and some of the um, uh, potentially prohibited areas as well. So moving on to the behavioral requirements, um, one of the um, big issues again is the uh, number of um, individuals in an area and the um, entrenchment associated with that that can create environmental uh, challenges. And so, um, tents, the, the ordinance before you would prohibit tents between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., except there are a number of exceptions. There are exceptions for disabled individuals for inclement weather. And um, we've added, as you'll see in a little bit, some exceptions for families and also for a caregiver for an individual who may be disabled. Um, and these would only be enforced after a daytime storage program is in effect and only after COVID-19 vaccines are available to the unhoused uh, community. So we did hear a lot of concerns about um, you know, the, the daytime prohibition and the effects that that could have during a uh, pandemic. And um, we have sought to address many of those concerns through the fact that these provisions would not be enforced until vaccines are available. And then the daytime storage program would provide an opportunity for individuals to store their belongings so that they can go to their jobs, so they can go to their medical appointments, so that they can um, go and uh, get the services that they need and not have to worry about whether or not their belongings are gonna be there when they get back. Um, we have um, a uh, provision here um, that we're proposing to change, and that is um, a deletion of the reference to vehicles in the outdoor living facilities definition. And that is because that, this ordinance is not specifically intended to uh, address uh, the, the uh, individuals who are residing in vehicles. Um, that would be addressed through um, uh, different uh, regulations, and so we wanted to clarify that here, and we'll be going through these and some additional um, uh, text changes in just a bit. Continuing with the behavioral requirements, limitations on storage, um, so car tires, bike parts, gas generators, various other items have limitations. Um, Sorry, no fires, um, I skipped over that one. Fires would not be allowed. Trash and litter standards, this is another one that we heard some um, good suggestions from the community and so we'll have um, some additional updates related to that in a moment and these include things like um, staying clear of, um, uh, of not having improperly disposed of needles. Um, and then we have a uh, 12 foot by 12 foot per person um, limitation and uh, a restriction on uh, not uh, creating environmental damage. Um, with that, um, we are on to the enforcement section here, and I will welcome Chief Andy Mills to speak to this section. Well, thank you, Director Butler, for that uh, thorough briefing on, on what the ordinance looks like. Uh, I think the main thing to understand is that uh, Santa Cruz Police Department is fully prepared uh, to enforce uh, the ordinance as you uh, implement it, should you choose to do so. And uh, the goal certainly is not to criminalize the homeless, but to gain voluntary compliance when possible. And so there's three tiers that have been set up in the ordinance to gain that compliance. Uh, the first tier is to warn. And uh, this is what we have been doing for some time is warning people, trying to talk with them, helping them move, 
uh, trying to prevent some of the problems that come with a significant size encampment. The second uh, uh, level up would be to cite people, and it would be a maximum of a $20 fine. And as you are aware, uh, if they get cited multiple times, uh, it can go to collections. And that's the most that we could possibly do. Uh, how, however, it could be diverted to community service uh, should that uh, person desire to do that instead. And then the third level up would be a misdemeanor charge. Uh, if a person refuses to leave uh, or we have to um, warn the person and cite the person multiple times within a 30-day period. Uh, this would be the leverage that we would need to actually gain some level of compliance. And uh, we felt that that was uh, important from the standpoint of uh, going forward. There are a certain percentage of the community who just doesn't want to go with uh, the norms and standards uh, that this community is setting forward. And so there has to be some kind of consequence uh, for that. We have to remember that a vast majority of the citations are uh, they don't appear on. And so if there's no consequence to it, it becomes difficult to manage the population. Um, I think one of the things I'd li really like for you to know is that this is about addressing the harms associated with uh, unlawful camping. And, and uh, because it allows us to prevent a buildup of large encampments by making sure that people are taking down their tents at, during the daytime and, and, and not getting entrenched and collecting all sorts of other uh, items that uh, sometimes these uh, encampments collect. And then the third thing is we want to make sure that we're activating the space uh, for the entire community to use. Uh, because right now, certain spaces in our community, because of camping, uh, people are prohibited from going there. And, and our focus initially would be on the beach, the downtown area, and the city parks uh, as our enforcement, uh, and, and then move on to the other areas of the city as we um, get the opportunity. Uh, this will take some cost and some time and some effort. Uh, we're going to have to put people out in uh, probably in overtime a couple times a week uh, to just get out there and uh, educate first, warn and then um, start the enforcement uh, process uh, when we can. Lee, if you could advance. The property removal and storage is obviously a, is an important piece. Um, this would give us a 24-hour notice unless it's exigent. Uh, and some of the camps that we come across are, are pretty exigent. I mean, they're large, they're environmental uh, hazard, uh, they're a public health hazard and those, those could be abated uh, fairly quickly. And then uh, the second piece would be a misdemeanor. So if there's personal property available uh, in those tents that might be stolen and we're going to arrest somebody, then we would collect that, uh, those personal items and store those personal items for the individual uh, to come back and get later, um, uh, rather than having them be, having them stolen or wind up missing. Uh, we also have and will continue to post encampments, uh, and then that will allow us to go in and abate those encampments um, after a week uh, without, um, if people are not, haven't, haven't moved by that time. And it also gives us a little bit more flexibility in the storage rather than in going to an encampment where there's an enormous amount of things to be impounded. We could impound it and store it all in a locked facility and allow them to come and get their stuff uh, without having to itemize every detail, it would be, um, it would be an enormous uh, effort uh, when some of these encampments have so many uh, different pieces. Um, the bottom line for us is uh, we want to make sure that we're uh, using uh, interpersonal skills, citations, and then arrests to gain compliance for our community. If that's the direction that you should choose to go. And uh, we're, we will stand by for uh, questions a little bit later. Thank you. So as Chief Mills mentioned, and as our Parks Director mentioned as well, this is not a uh, ordinance that is going to end homelessness, but um, it does provide some tools to 
address some of the problems, particularly those problems that arise with large groups and entrenchment. Um, moving on to the last section, uh, thanks for hanging in there. We've got um, a, a big last section here because um, we had many, many public comments, um, hundreds of pages of public comments, as you all know. And um, some of the things that we heard were that um, residential sidewalks um, should not uh, allow camping. And um, one thing that um, we would recommend is that if um, the council is considering taking residential sidewalks off of the table for um, a place where uh, unhoused individuals can go, we would recommend that the council simultaneously provide recommendations on alternative identified locations. So whether that's parks or parking lots or closed portions of the right of way. Um, and um, we've got um, some draft language in case you are um, interested in doing any of that, uh, you can consider that draft language. Um, hours of camping, we heard some people say more, some people say less, and um, we started building in all the changes um, and we could not actually um, get them all into the PowerPoint. So I'm gonna shift for a moment and go to a uh, Google Doc here. Can you all see this uh, document? Great, I'm gonna just see if I can make it larger here. Maybe it's a little too big, okay. Um, so we have a series of uh, of uh, potential changes for the council to consider based on a wide range of uh, comments that came in. Um, I'm gonna try to go through them quickly and we can go back at the end, um, if, if we can go back after the presentation, if anyone has questions, we'll have opportunities. So um, we talked about removing the vehicles and vehicular camping. Um, here, um, it's a clarification that if items do remain in, this is part of the outdoor living encampment definition, if items do remain in the same location for 12 hours, then it's considered an outdoor living encampment. Um, other comments, this is part of the, um, this is the only change uh, other than the, the numbers going from three to six and from two to three in private property. Um, there were some suggestions that, um, that the private property should also not be used for trafficking in illegal drugs or in a manner that creates a public or private nuisance. And those uh, seem like reasonable um, uh, items for the council to consider. Um, and then this is the change related to um, uh, eliminating neighborhood and community parks, just all parks, but not including open spaces. Um, and then we still have the, um, no outdoor living allowed in the identified open spaces. Um, I've just highlighted these. I, um, we don't have anything to speak about uh, unless the council wants to make uh, any edits related to that. This is where I talked with you about the, uh, the additional um, allowances for families um, with one or more children under the age of 18 years old um, and for a single caregiver for a person with a qualifying disability. So um, this section speaks to both of those, allowing for um, members of a family unit um, uh, or for a caregiver to remain in a location. You'll recall down here that this would allow for um, individuals to occupy uh, space for 96 hours instead of all of the, uh, the daily um, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. prohibitions. And then there is one additional addition here, which is just that a physician's verification is evidence, but isn't necessarily binding evidence in all instances as it relates to a qualifying disability. Um, this section right here, this is um, if the council wanted to um, eliminate um, residential sidewalks, this could be some language that could be used. So right here, um, this is the section that allows for camping on um, sidewalks. And um, the, uh, the ordinance could be modified to um, eliminate these residential sections. And then um, there's some additional uh, items where cleaning could be allowed. So maintenance, 
limiting the incidence or frequency of the sale of unlawful drugs, um, limiting or controlling crime, um, limiting domestic violence or other violence, accumulation of debris and syringe waste, um, du amount, duration, and effect of urination or defecation on public pri and private property, and uh, limiting adverse effects on surrounding area. So some additional clarification for why uh, uh, the city manager could um, close an area. Um, and then um, let's see if um, keep moving on here. So, um, so this is I, I talked about this. This is the section where um, camping or outdoor living is permitted, and this is the clarifying language. These may be authorized on public or private properties in any zoning district and in areas that would otherwise prohibit such uses. And then if the council wanted to eliminate um, the residential sidewalks, this is a, uh, a piece that the council could include to expand um, the additional allowances. So if you're saying no residential sidewalks, um, the council should also consider alternative areas and this would say, um, in a part or all of a city-owned parking lot, closed portion of a public right-of-way on private property or in an alternative space or area designated by the city manager for safe sleeping. And this says that the city manager or his or her designee shall establish a program for overnight use of no fewer than 150 safe sleeping spaces in such areas, subject to all the criteria contained in the section. I'm, I'm sure um, if the council is interested in the residential portion, um, we'll be back at this and we'll have opportunity to discuss it at length. The council can provide direction to be very specific or very general. You could say, you know, keep this language, but focus on areas. So it's, it's up to the council's discretion on how they might want to treat this. But we wanted to have a starting point for some language in case the council did want to um, make modifications to that section, as we heard from many of the um, the uh, people who were writing in. Um, this one was some clarification language that we received um, that I thought was good. Um, so electrical connections, we had, we had previously just said uh, electrical taps. And so that clarifies electrical connections or taps. And then um, there's some clarification about fires that they may be allowed in a lawfully created um, fire pit or other permanent receptacle provided for by the city. And then um, I mentioned some of the um, litter and debris. There were some suggestions from the community. So um, the encampments shall be maintained reasonably safe, tidy, and healthy, free from various debris, and with, food, with uh, debris contained in a bag or container. And then this just states that, that it will be contained and that the encampment shall be cleared of personal belongings as um, uh, the occupants um, leave the area. Continuing on, this um, is a companion to the um, item with relation to the um, person with the qualifying disability is allowed to occupy a 12 foot by 12 foot space. Um, and this said that, um, that if you've got 20 people at a camp, and there's one individual with a qualifying disability that you know you don't you don't get the 20 people having a 12 by 12 area. Um, we actually got a, a comment. We got some comments with some confusion about that, and so we ought, we thought to clarify that here. And we also wanted to say that your caretaker can also have their own 12 by 12 area. And so that's the the language that's included right here. And we're happy to I'm happy to spend more time on the language here if um, if you all have questions about it. Um, and I believe that is the last. Um, yes, that is the last. Um, so I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint here. And. Um, thank you for hanging in there with me. I know this was a long presentation and we are on the last slide. Um, so we are available for questions. Um, there will be public comment and then um, following that, there will be um, council deliberation, including um, the edits and options. And um, these are a few of those. 
but um, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have, and um, we look forward to hearing uh, the direction from the council.